Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our public hearing concerning the ecosystem regulations. Go ahead and come on in and take a seat. Uh, we have folks participating here in the room as well as a number assembled online on Zoom and looking forward to a good public hearing on our ecosystem regulations. Um, by way of introductions, I'm Jeff Henderson, Deputy Executive Officer for Planning at the Delta Stewardship Council. I'm joined by Eva Bush, who is our Program Manager for our regulatory unit within the Planning Division, and a number of other staff who will be assisting us throughout the afternoon. For those of you participating on Zoom, um, in order to comment, please raise your hand using the Zoom function. Email engage at deltacouncil.ca.gov or call 916-275-6824. When we get to that portion of the meeting, the clerk will call your name when it's your turn to speak. And we ask that you state your name and affiliation for the record before beginning your comments. So what we have on tap for um, this afternoon is a brief presentation on sort of the scope and function of the proposed regulations and the process that we're engaged in. And then a period of time, I, I sort of structured this as a period of time for clarifying questions, which we can and will address to the best of our ability. And then comments, which are offered from the participants, but not responded, what won't be responded to today by staff. Those comments will be responded to in the final statement of reasons that we will be releasing later this summer. Can everybody hear me okay? I can speak up a little. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, so let's go ahead and advance to the first slide. What the proposed regulations would do technically is that the council's proposing to make a number of changes to California Code of Regulations, Title 23, Division 6, to make technical conforming amendments to sections 5001 through 5015 inclusive, to make substantive amendments to sections 5001, 5006, 5007, and 5008, and to add a new section 5005.1, as well as three appendices, Appendix 3A, Appendix 4A, and Appendix 8A. Next slide. So I'm going to go over a bit um, what some of the proposed regulations would do, beginning with section 5005.1, which is a new section that would require state and local public agencies to disclose contributions for ecosystem function, restoration, and the social benefits provided in the Delta from those contributions. It would also require disclosure of cultural, recreational, agricultural, and natural resources benefits anticipated from the completion of a covered action project. Essentially, these are disclosure requirements at the core. Section 5006 would be amended. This is our, this is our regulatory policy that we refer to as ERP2 in the Delta Plan. It would require that state and local public agencies that are proposing a project in what's known as the intertidal elevation band and sea level rise accommodation band to explain how the project would accommodate future marsh migration, anticipated sea level rise, and tidal inundation. If that accommodation is not possible, it would also require an explanation for the exception provided. The policy would also require state and local public agencies, the regulation would require state and local public agencies based on best available science to explain how the project is designed to safeguard against levee failure should the project take place in the shallow subtitle elevation band or the deep subtitle elevation band, focusing on accounting for future impacts and an added safeguard to reduce flood risk in the Delta. And these elevation bands are defined in a map that is included as part of the regulation. Next slide. Oh, not yet, sorry. Stay on proposed regulations. Section 5008 would be amended to re redefine the range, and this is policy ERP 8 in the Delta, ERP 4 in the Delta Plan. This would refine the range of levees that are included in the policy and would incorporate the Stanislaus River, 
the Cassumnes River, the Middle River, the Old River, and Elk Slough, while updating and clarifying language for new flood control works that includes permanent structural changes or improvements in flood control functions, while allowing for future adaptations depending on delta needs and climate changes. Additionally, the proposed rulemaking would include new defined terms from some of the regulatory uh, policies, would make technical conforming changes throughout the regulations, and would incorporate appendices 3A, 4A, and 8A. The anticipated benefits associated with the project would be that it would benefit the health and welfare of California residents and protect the environment. Oh, next slide, sorry. It would protect existing ecosystems, restore ecosystems, and enhance working or urban landscapes that provide habitat resources to species. The approaches can reestablish ecological processes and natural communities to make them more resilient to land conversion and climate change. And the proposed regulations are based on decades of research, lessons learned in recovery planning, and increased coordination among agencies and partners working toward a common vision for a restored Delta ecosystem. Next slide. Project does also have potential costs and the economic and fiscal impact assessment that's associated with the proposed regulations estimates that the proposal would add about 0.6 FTE jobs within California, that it's unlikely the proposal would eliminate jobs within California, that it's unlikely the proposal would create new businesses in California, that it's unlikely the proposal would eliminate existing businesses within California, that the proposal could result in some expansion of businesses currently doing business within the state, and that the proposal would benefit the health and welfare of California residents, worker safety, and the state's environment. Next slide. So the environment or the economic and fiscal impact assessment also includes a summary of direct impacts and the direct financial impacts that are observed in the FIA are an increase in spending on professional services for environmental consulting to complete Appendix 3A, which is a part of Section 5005.1. That's the disclosure of ecological and social benefits requirement. And that would have a direct impact on average of $60,000 a year. Increase in spending on professional services for environmental consulting to complete Appendix 4A, which applies to Section 5006, which would be a direct impact of $40,000 on average per year, and an increase in spending on professional services for engineering for additional evaluations that would be required under Section 5008 of approximately $400,000 on average per year. That particular direct cost is also offset by a decrease in spending on professional services for engineering for a fewer number of levy alternative evaluations. So on the, on, the, on the plus side, it's an additional 400K for evaluation of additional alternatives for each project considered. On the savings side, it's a minus 400K for evaluation of alternatives across a lower number of levy projects because there've been modifications to the areas in which those are required. That concludes the presentation and happy to entertain questions. Again, what we'd like to do, we'll take questions first from the room and then I'll ask Eric to forward in some questions from the Zoom. Um, what we, we are in a position to answer clarifying questions this afternoon, but again, not to respond to comments. So what I'd like to do is split the time into a period for questions and then transition to the period for comments. And for comments, the responses, again, will be provided as part of the final, the final statement of reasons. Okay, are there questions from anyone in the room for clarification? Tom. Actually, Tom, could I ask you just to state for the record since we have to report? Tom said the recent time that I decentralized the control association. 
the, the last slide there, can you elaborate a little bit on how you've got a net gain of one? I mean, I, I see the math. When it says decrease in spending on professional services for engineering, fewer levy, and you open, but what, what, what does that encompass? So section 5008 requires evaluation of alternatives if when you're proposing a levy project requires evaluation of alternatives to that project that would enhance floodplain values. One alternative that could be evaluated is a setback levy. The $400,000 increase in spending on professional services is associated with additional alternatives being considered on each project. So compared to the existing regulation, this would evaluate, this regulation would require evaluation of a number of additional alternatives that would be essentially equivalent to the labor time associated with consultants that would be uh, on the order of $400,000. The decrease in spending on professional services is associated with a fewer number of projects that need to do those evaluations because the map that, that outlines the areas where those evaluations are required has been changed largely to remove the central delta from consideration in these alternatives. Does that yeah, answer your question? And, and these are, sorry, this is Mike Moncrief, MBK Engineers, also uh, representing Central Valley Flood Control Association. Uh, this is a, a, an estimate of the the annual anticipated average annual based on the number of covered actions considered that, that have been received in, in, on an annual basis. Right. So it takes an annual number, uh, takes an average, it looks back across the total totality of covered actions that we've received, takes a year and applies an average. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, Eric, what have we got on Zoom? Chandra, you should be able to speak now. Hi. Yeah. Hello. Oh, sorry. Thank, thank you. Um, uh, can I provide a comment now, or is this Q and A time? I, I thought I prefer to separate the clarifying questions from comments. We will come back around for comments, but if you have a clarifying question, we're happy to respond. I. Uh, I think I can wait. Just uh, you don't need. Them. I'll just provide the comments later. Thank you. Thank you. Should I keep checking through? Yes, the raised hands. Yeah, okay. raised hand. Brian Barnhart, you should be able to unmute. Do you have a question Good or a comment, Brian? I bet you can hear me now. Yeah. Yep. All right. Um, I have. A number of questions, and please, please cut me off when I've used up my time. Uh, my first question is, what kind of, okay, so when you include the appendices, we're talking about dozens and dozens of questions here that are going to need to be answered for habitat restoration projects, and then also um, for levy repair projects, restoration projects. Do these regulations require a full record to be put together to support every answer to every question in these appendices? And just to be clear, because the appellate procedures um, require you to provide a list of all the documents in your record at the time of certification, this would be, you know, if, if this record is required, we everybody would need to put it together before they like when they submit their certification. So are we talking about a full record for every question? No, no. The questions, essentially the way to interpret that policy is that the, the key is to evaluate 
and to document the applicability of the policy to your project and if the policy applies to your project to the best of your ability to fill out the checklist. There is no expectation of the gathering of the record at the time of certification other than an assessment. As, as you note, the appeals procedures require a listing of the materials in the record to the best of your ability, anything that you relied on to fill out that checklist. Okay, so I guess the next question becomes if there was, and thank you for that, by the way, I should start there. Um, if there is an appeal, then does the uh, regulation require a full administrative record to support all the answers in the checklist? Or I think what I just heard you say, I feel I'm just asking the same thing over and over. I think what I just heard you say is that you need to have something in the record that shows whether the policy is applicable or not. And then you've got all of these questions you need to answer if you know the answer. So I don't know might be an adequate answer for some of them. It, am I understanding you saying that correctly? The obligation would be to fill out the checklist using the information that the department relies upon. In this instance, the department would rely upon to answer those questions to the degree that you have information to support those answers. That's the extent of the expectation. Okay, we're getting closer. So does the certifying agency need to go find information to answer the questions? Oh, no. Okay, and then that's uh, the same basic question for the uh, levy one, it's 5008, I think. Um, would a certifying agency, in order to evaluate the alternatives, be required to go out and do new studies or new modeling in order to get the information and do the evaluation that they do it? Or, or can they just rely on the information they already have from, say, going through the CEQA process? Hi, this is Brian. This is Eva. Hi, Eva. The regulation as far as evaluation and feasibility has not changed from before. So whatever approach the department took before should be um, used for, for um, the policy as it's, uh, as it's written now as well. Right, the 5008 evaluation is not a new requirement. And I, the final question is just on your, the last slide that we saw, the direct summary of impacts or the summary of direct impacts, there we go. Um, the $500,000, that's cumulative. You're saying that's how much you think it's gonna be on average for all covered actions filed within a particular year? On It's an average annual based on the average number of appeals, or not appeals, average number of certifications received by the council in a given year across the history of the covered actions. So okay. it's best to think of that as an average annual. Okay. And then is there, because I didn't get it from the regulations themselves, the, the answers to the questions that you gave earlier, um, is the council going to give formal written guidance? Uh, saying, for example, that you don't need to create a full administrative record for every question, you just answer it to the best of your ability if the policy applies? Or is this it? <laughs> no, I can't, I can't at this point speak for the council in that regard. Okay, that's fair. Okay, I'm done. Thank you very much. I appreciate your patience and your answers but especially your patience. <laughs> okay. Um, before we get to that, I have um, Teji with DWR. Should we be able to speak now? Good afternoon, Teji. Teji, can you? Unmute yourself. Hi there, can you hear me now? 
Yeah, it's a little broken up, so. Sorry, I'll, I'll try to speak up a little bit. Um, I only had my hand raised when that first question went up um, from maybe a board member. I, it was hard to hear the folks in the room. Um, and then I will just save my comment for comment period time. Thank you. Thank you. Eric, perhaps we can move that microphone around as we need to. We have been since then, yeah. But thank you for letting us know about that, Beijing. Uh Gilbert Cosio, did you have a question? Good afternoon, Gil. Hi, can, can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, Jeff, I have a couple of questions, I guess mostly on the process, I guess. So were these ever vetted uh, to Delta stakeholders to find out their feedback on how, how these things might be implemented um, and their concerns? And if, if not, why not? And then as far as the process, um, so as I understand that you're having a hearing today, you're gonna to get some questions like we're discussing now, then you'll get some comments. Um, the comments will not be addressed except in the statement of reasons that would then go to the, the final report to the stewardship council that they would vote on. Is that is that what's gonna happen? Let me Let me answer the second question first. The responses to the comments that we received today will be a part of the final statement of reasons, which will be made publicly available ahead of the council's consideration of that final statement of reasons and our staff recommendation to the council to authorize us to, to push that material to the, uh, to, to the Office of Administrative Law for completion of the process. So yes, those comments will be responded to. It'll be in It'll be in the final statement of reasons. And yes, that is presented to the council. So the first part of the question about engaging with folks regarding these proposed regulations. Proposed regulations are in essence, the regulatory policies that were considered in 2022 by the council when it adopted the ecosystem amendment for the Delta plan. And that process itself was a four-year engagement that did include extensive outreach, both within the communities in the Delta, as well as with the agencies that conduct a lot of the restoration activity. So there was a considerable amount of outreach associated with these, albeit it was a number of years ago. Does that answer your question, Gil? Yeah, I don't think it was clear that some of these regulations that would uh, would be handled uh, would be dealt with in this way. And then, and also during the process, I remember making comments about that the map, the elevation map, um, that it's kind of misleading because some of those elevations you can't get to without flooding out a bunch of islands. So I'm a little bit concerned that that. Uh, the people might think that there are some intertidal or um, uh, sea level rise accommodation bands that are could be could be real, but they're not because I don't think anybody would want to flood an island about two thirds of an island to get to a small strip of uh, of habitat. So I'm a little. Yo, I'm, I would I would encourage you to capture that portion in a comment, either orally today or in a comment letter that you submit. Okay, and then the final question. So when it gets to the council with your statement of reasons, the final report, that will be another hearing that we'd have a chance to comment at? That would be a normal council meeting where the Bagley Keene public comment rules would be in place. So there would be an opportunity for public comment but those comments would not be reflected in the final regulations unless directed by the council. Okay, thanks. Who do we have in the room with a Any question? Any other questions? Question. Do you have a question? Yeah, sorry, I was a little late, so I'm sorry if someone already asked this. Uh, could you guys clarify? Kirsten, could you? Sorry, state your name? Kirsten Pringle with MBK Engineers. Thank you. Can you please provide clarifications? There are three sections within three subsections within each of the sections that touch on the CEQA requirements. 
about when certain changes within the regulations would go into effect. Could you just clarify how that would impact CEQA documents, the covered actions that have CEQA documents that are currently being developed or maybe are already developed, but they haven't gone through the certification of consistency process? So the way, the way that that is set up is in essence to say, upon the date upon which these regulations are adopted by the council, there would be a two year period of time following that date that for the subject regulations, the expectation would be that the certifying agency would use the existing ecosystem regulations for a project for which an NO, if it's an EIR, an NOP was released prior to the effective date of the regulation. So let's say, let's, Let's say you have a project that issued its NOP a year ago, and let's say the, the effective regulations go into place in January of 2025. There would be a period from January 2025 to January 2027 where that project could certify against the existing regulations. Okay. I guess it's still clear, at least to me, the, uh, the relationship between these CEQA documents and the regulations themselves. Like I understand the checklist and I understand the section 5008 about alternatives from these setback levy zones, um, but what's the clear connection between the CEQA documents for covered action and the proposed changes in the regulations? There's no connection. Okay, yeah. I guess that language having in there makes it a little confusing. That's why I'm just trying to better understand that portion. Yeah, the, of the, the, the reference to CEQA in that instance is really to just identify that that filing of the notice of preparation. Again, in the case of an EIR, that filing of a notice of preparation is the operative piece that enables a project to take advantage of the legacy clause. Okay. Mike, did you have a clarifying question? I, I think that, that was a, I think we, there was a potential misunderstanding that if, uh, your CEQA analysis or, or your findings did not meet. Sorry, Mike Moncrief, MBK Engineers. Um, uh, to add to it, it, the concern was whether or not um, Stewardship Council um, consistency determination would require um, a, additional uh, CEQA evaluations. And so the two year stopgap going back on the legacy language is appropriate, but then moving forward, there, there could be. Uh, additional requirements of the council and, and their analysis of the project if we don't meet the consistency determination. That, that is not the case. That is not the case. Right. Thanks. You're welcome. Any other questions before we move to comments? Yes, Emily. I apologize for coming in late if this question is already asked, but Emily, can oh, you go this ahead? is uh, Emily Popolardo with DCC Engineering. Um, in the section 5008, when you talk about um, looking at feasibility of setback levy or increasing the channel, with do we have to submit a feasibility study or what's the requirement expected there? The requirement there, and this is a point I think Eva addressed earlier, the requirement there is no different than it is today. Okay. There's no increased burden in terms of like a specific type of analysis that's required that's not already required. What we are doing is just encouraging a broader range of alternatives, not just exclusively set back up. Okay. Right. Does that answer your question? Yes. Thanks. All right, last call for any questions for folks who are currently participating. Do you see anything on Zoom? Okay, let's move to comments then. And just we can start with folks in the room. Eric will bring the magic microphone around. But anybody like to go first? Mike. I was expecting a little bit more of a formal proceeding with uh, little timers and we're trying to keep it a little more. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
Yeah. Very serious. Very, very appreciative of the opportunity to provide comments. So, um, uh, as I said earlier, my name is Michael Moncrief, uh, MVK Engineers, on behalf of the Central Valley Flood Control Association today. Uh, primarily, the association does represent approximately 30 reclamation districts in the Delta. So, the perspective we're coming from is just making sure that uh, with our advocacy and uh, fact finding, we want to provide uh, best available information to our associate members, but also convey uh, uh, to the council our interest in participating and engaging um, in rulemaking and uh, appreciate this opportunity for comments. Um, <clears throat> one of our, our big concerns, obviously, and, and uh, you have the table up still, is our financial concerns with our our agencies as we um, submit our consistency determination findings moving into the future. Uh, with the current financial uncertainties that we have at the state, our local agencies are always trying to evaluate and, and budget for whatever our uh, future anticipated costs may be to develop any number of, of projects, let alone our uh, responsibilities uh, and obligations to operate and maintain our system. When there is uh, funding for improvement and enhancements in the Delta in the future, it will likely always be tied to multi-benefit projects. And for local agencies, our primary, fo primary focus is always flood control, but finding those limited opportunities for multi-benefit within our respective systems will trigger uh, our consistency determination requirements and uh, these additional uh, forms that will need to be evaluated. Uh, along with, in several areas, uh, uh, Section 5008 requirements. Uh, I just, uh, primarily for the association, we want to express our concerns about those additional costs for local agencies where our focus is primarily from the flood control uh, requirement to stabilize the system of levees. Um, I think your, your plans have shown the need for uh, long-term investment our local funds that typically are required for any uh, state cost share do not go that far these days uh, with increased costs with utilities, construction, environmental uh, engineering costs um, ever increasing. Uh, even though these costs do appear to be somewhat minor, I, I, would, uh, I would stress that any cost is significant moving forward and any uh, continued expansion of regulation and requirements for reporting are going to be felt locally, and that does impact uh, a lot of our smaller agencies. Um, uh, some larger agencies may have the ability to afford these costs, but most of most of the public agencies within the Delta may not be able to afford these costs, let alone uh, the difficulty in uh, competing for these grant funds in the future. Uh, the, the next point, I only wanted to make two. Uh, we are going to provide written comments, so thank you. Uh, the other point that I wanted to express is the evaluation of uh, setback uh, alternatives within the regions that have been uh, reduced, focusing primarily on the North Delta, South Delta, and then the East Side streams connected to the North Delta region. Um, I just want to make a clarifying statement that North and South Delta are, are primarily state plan of flood control systems, and there is a significant um, authorization burden um, for doing any modifications or decertifications or setbacks of federal levy systems uh, requiring an act of Congress. Uh, these are significant um, undertakings uh, requiring multiple years of uh, 408 reviews, system evaluations, geotechnical, hydraulic analysis. Um, if, if these districts receive grant funding to perform multi-benefit projects, enhancement projects, it, it's more than likely that even on face value, setbacks in these regions are not viable. Um, and not to question the validity of, of um, requiring the analysis, but these costs to set back these major federal systems are going to be extremely expensive. Um, notwithstanding, these project levies um, have mature habitat types, riparian habitat types. These are natural high ground areas, natural the natural riverbanks of uh, the flood control system um, prior to development of the, the project system. And so setting these levees back seems like a, a unreasonable uh, expectation can be evaluated, but we question 
the expense and the cost and the value of going through that process. If, if anything, an opportunity to stabilize and enhance these areas would probably be more preferred by most reclamation districts. There are, there are opportunities, but there are not significant opportunities um, from, from our understanding. Um, I'll stop there. Um, we will be providing written comments on, on all the elements uh, of the rulemaking and thank you very much and always appreciate the ability to engage and, and be part of the process. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Anyone else in the room wish to offer comments? Um, let's pass the mic over there. Thank you. Let me, uh, without getting into Tom, could I ask you just? I'm sorry, I'm sorry Jeff. Uh, Tom stated with RD 999, as well as chairman of the board for the Flood Control Association. So I speak on both behalf today. Uh, Mike alluded to the fact that there's over 30 RDs in the just members of the association, far many more uh, RDs in the Delta. If I can uh, expand on on the burden or the potential burden of cost for these specific RDs, I think it's tantamount. Uh, it, we are the largest RD in the Delta, I think. We're within a few acres one way or another, and we're nearly 26,000 acres. So, so in one sense, we're very fortunate to, to divide our bill by that many acres, so to speak. Our assessment goes out on a per acre basis, um, and, and we are managed by five board members, as most RDs are in the Delta. So to, to make the case, if we're the largest, and I don't think we can fund it uh, economically, what is the two and 3,000 acre RDs that have to maintain similar number of levees or miles of levees? We have 33 miles of levee. Someone next to us may have six miles of levee. Uh, the issue is funding and the grants that, that are provided us have term limits and time constraints on them to do these major projects and come up with uh, consistency plans is extremely expensive for a RD that has an annual budget of $110,000 and all of that goes to maintaining the levies to the best we can for the state plan of flood control, uh, working with our partners at DWR and the flood board and so forth. So I think it's cost prohibitive, or it looks like it will be. For me, I don't know how anyone else could do it. Uh, that isn't diminish the, the relevance of doing it or the importance of doing it or, or any other reason. I'm not questioning that right now. In my comments, they may come. But, that's a, that's a different issue. I, I think it needs to be considered. We hope that the council will consider some of our concerns and maybe variances for something that's not gonna lead to a successful consistency anyway. Maybe you don't have to do it. We just can't be impacted anymore completing these multi-benefit projects that we're all agreeing we need to do. We've, we've shifted. I'm old enough to know how this is all shifted for the good. And, and we're comfortable doing it, now tag on another huge cost for something that's not uh, pertinent to a specific district and may, may prevent them from uh, doing some very, very good uh, operations and maintenance and repair work on the existing levees. So uh, I, I'm, I'm rambling a bit, Jeff, and uh, I think you get the point, or I hope the council gets the point that there's concern here uh, monetarily, and and uh, that's that's tantamount to it. Um, the the fact that uh, we we just recently completed an elk slough feasibility study. We got a million dollar grant from Conservancy, and it was just a beautifully done uh, feasibility study on elk slough, which is 9.4 miles, and it's listed in your uh, prospectus here, if you will. Um, that's the only tributary that has never been part of the state bank protection deal. It is pristine, beautiful, and we're working diligently to try to keep that enhanced, keep it the way it is, as well as provide flood control. A setback levy wipes out 
hundreds of years of beautiful, pristine, old wood. It's like cutting your nose off to spite your face. <laughs> uh, so, so that's a concern when we see setback levees in here. And, and I understand that they're full setback levees, so you would require to remove the old existing 200-year levees. Um, more concerns that I, that I can uh, put in writing a little bit later on or this week. But uh, other than that, I would just be duplicative if I, if I continued. And, and, and you, you should know, in fact, I know you do know, and everyone on the council knows, the, the uh, evidence and existence of tribal areas in the Delta is incredible. This cannot be, to me, done respectfully with, with those entities. And, it, and it's a big concern for us. We're, we're trying to preserve all that. Uh, and whether there's room in here or not, uh, it, it has come up. And so that's another concern going forward uh, with, with these consistency hearings. So with that, I'll leave it. And, and, and we will be making some comments to uh, on paper. Thank you, Tom. Um, do I have to announce myself? Yeah. Oh, Emily Poplardo with DCC Engineering. I don't want to belabor the point. I think I just want to concur that with what Mike and Tom said about the financial burden on the reclamation districts and how onerous, you know, I think this process that we're adding on here to the consistency finding will be. Um, and also, you know, when you look at um, increasing channel width or um, setback levees, especially, you know, on the northern part of Sacramento River, that there's only really one direction they can go, and that's west, because um, you, you can't really go in the pocket and, and increase the, the widths there. Um, but yeah, I think ultimately it's time and money to get these kinds of, I'm currently working on a multi-benefit project, and it's a lot of, of lift to even get that going and it's going to benefit everyone. It's just, um, there's a lot of regulation that we already have to, to endure. And so to add more makes it harder to actually do the work. I think we're all trying to do in the Delta. Thank you, Emily. Okay, shall we move online? First, we have Chandra Shilmakuri. Should be able to unmute yeah. now. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, my name is Chandra Shilmakuri with Stewart Contractors. Um, uh, we appreciate the work that uh, Council has been putting in uh, into these policies and all the past engagement with us on this effort. We at state board contractors have long, long supported ecosystem restoration in the Delta to further the co-equal goals. And we understand ecosystem restoration is not only required for compliance with environmental permits, but it is essential to protect our uh, state board project uh, reliability or supply reliability. We will be providing um, written comments here by the deadline, but uh, I Generally, our comments are uh, aimed at clarifying the proposed regulations. I'll, uh, today, for uh, verbally, I just want to highlight a few of those uh, recommendations that we, you will find in our comment letter. Uh, the first one is that we would like you, uh, the staff to clarify that the new or amended regulations would only apply to covered actions that constitute ecosystem restoration projects and not every covered action that includes any ecosystem restoration are subject to these new regulations. Many covered actions may include small amounts of ecosystem preservation or restoration as mitigation, but should not be subjected to the new regulations that are geared towards standalone ecosystem restoration projects. The second point uh, I'd like to raise is the the council should 
include definitions of the terms intertidal elevation band, sea level rise accommodation band, subtidal elevation band, and deep subtidal elevation band in the regulations. Those terms are currently defined in a, an appendix to the Delta plan, but because they are used in the regulations, they should be defined in the regulations. That way, if the council proposes to amend the definitions in the future, the public will receive notice and an opportunity to comment. The third point is uh, the council should adopt a regulatory definition of sea level rise accommodation band that is based on the best available science which does not project 10 feet of sea level rise at, by 2100. The new projections that are reported in the Ocean Protection Council's 2024 draft, up, draft update to sea level rise uh, guidance reports a reasonable range of 1.6 feet to 3.3 feet by 2100. The new guidance rejects the extreme high sea level rise scenario the current definition is based on as much higher than best available science suggests. Lastly, the, the requirement of covered action subject to section 5006, safeguard against levy failure, should be clarified uh, whether it means that the, the action, um, whether this uh, section would require the action to include feasible measures to protect it from levy failure uh, or not, um, Sorry, um, predicted from levy failure, uh, not incorporate levy improvements to avoid levy failure. Uh, it, it is vague. Uh, we just want to make sure that if the intent is that the um, covered action should include measures to safeguard against levy failure, then I think it would, that we, we would propose some uh, changes to the text. Uh, clarifying that, and we would uh, we have that uh, in our written comments. The point is that there is a, a we we want to make sure that this is not suggesting that the agency undertaking the covered action um, would have to prevent levy failure. That's uh, the agency that's taking the covered action may or not own or operate the nearby levies, and they may not be able to do it. With that, I'll, uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to comment and welcome the continued engagement with the council staff and the council, and we will submit our written comments shortly. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chandra. Next, we have Gilbert Cosio. Uh, thanks again. Gilbert Cosio, uh, River Delta Consulting. I just want to, um, for the record, just add some of the comments that I, I was kind of phrasing as a question earlier. Uh, just to kind of clarify, so so the first comment uh, has to do with uh, some of these elevation bands and being able to reach them with water uh, to be intertidal or uh, exposed to a sea level rise. Uh, there are a lot of um, levees that will have to come down to do that, and in, in getting the water to those elevation bands um, will flood out, deep flood, a lot of agricultural ground. This came up in the mid-90s. Uh, at the beginning of CalFed, when uh, an NGO wrote to the state saying, the state should just buy all the islands and breach the levees and, and flood it. And we got a hold of that letter and uh, actually sat down, had an ad hoc committee with uh, that NGO and some others and came to some pretty good conclusions. But in, the bottom line was they realized that that kind of attitude was not going to work because all you're going to have is a big ocean, uh, open water deep in deeply subsided areas. And so uh, just be aware that some of these areas are, are not as available as the, as the maps may show for um, the type of uh, ecosystem improvements that, that the plan is looking at. And the same thing with, uh, especially in the North Delta, as Tom Slater and others have, have mentioned, uh, these levees uh, that are now project levees were built upon the natural levee, which before California became a state, where it was the high, only high ground in the Delta. And so that's where uh, Native Americans had their uh, villages and ceremonial grounds and burial grounds. And so we know that in the door, um, Cultural Resources Survey 
those old maps that come up from the 50s, 1850s and 1860s show them pretty clearly. Um, and then so the tribes will comment on that and the likelihood of setting back any of those levees in the North Delta or anywhere else that's a, had been an original natural levee are pretty much slim to none uh, because of the issues that, that will be brought up by the Native Americans. Um, and then finally, uh, as others have, have spelled out, the um, reclamation districts and the landowners within the Delta are pretty much owners of all the land you see uh, that's slated to be habitat. I mean, there are some what they call public agencies, but in, the, in those areas, a lot of the major habitat development is, is not slated. And so you will have to deal with a reclamation district and Delta landowners, and it's gonna be very difficult to get them on board uh, because setback levies take up so much ground. Um, in fact, some of these setback levies were setback levies that uh, were shown in BDCP, that's what you know really caused a lot of problems besides the um, the Delta conveyance that went along with BDCP. That uh, when you look at the setback levees, it would take out Clarksburg and all the other uh, small towns in the Delta because they're built right against the levee. Um, that's not going to be an easy thing to uh, to pass through the, the Delta stakeholders. So that's all I have for now. We'll, we'll be preparing um, some written comments. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Gil. Okay. Maybe last call for comments for the folks who are present here. We'll, we will remain online until six o'clock as advertised. Okay. For those here, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, again, the comments that you've offered will be responded to in the final statement of reasons that will be presented to the council in later this year. <laughs> um, AG had yes. his hand raised. Yeah, sorry, this is Sandu from DWR. I thought I had my hand raised, but apparently I did not. So appreciate you letting me speak. I think I just wanted to um, say thank you for the opportunity to provide comment. Um, I think the PWRs, I don't wanna belabor the point, it seems like everybody today has kind of captured our comments, our um, overarching comments. I think I just wanted to mention, um, thank you for clarifying the administrative record and kind of what is a required portion of documents required to uh, support some of those responses on the checklist. Um, I think, what would be helpful, and I, I think it's been mentioned earlier, is that a supplemental guidance document would be super helpful in being able to clarify some of the terms that have been used or that others have asked for more clarification on. I think for DWR, some of the terms um, such as like evaluate or where visible, some more guidance on that would be helpful. Um, potentially more guidance on what best available science, what is meant by that would be helpful. I think we share some of the same uh, deeper concerns as others do, as well as additional costs, specifically for smaller projects. Um, we are hoping the burden doesn't make some of those infeasible. Um, PWR does a lot of multi-benefit projects, and so filling out some of those forms could be oner onerous in making sure, you know, where we have multiple uh, portions of a project that we're not filling those out, you know, clarification on if, if we need to be filling those out for each component of a project or if the overall project is good enough. Um, so some of those, some of those things, and we will be providing a more formal comment letter by the due date of uh, May 17th. So you'll see some of that, but um, just want to thank you for the opportunity to comment and providing some of that Q and A earlier was helpful. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chachi. Okay. So again, thank you to those who gathered here with us. You're free to remain or to go about your day. Yes. I could have an additional comment. <laughs> Mike Moncrief again with with MBK Engineers, and uh, I just wanted to uh, uh, provide additional comment and, and say that it, uh, 
with previous consistency determination filings, uh, the greatest asset that the council has provided is, is their staff time and, and the resources of, of the uh, staff available to work in collaboration with these agencies for, for submittal of these, uh, these products for the council review. Uh, if, if similar uh, resources and capabilities are available uh, moving forward, even with the, these new uh, requirements, um, our, our hope is that uh, council staff and um, uh, appropriate resources will be available to help support and guide um, some of the decision making that's going to have to be performed by these applicants to address uh, these comments appropriately. It's always difficult when, when we evaluate uh, some of these appendices and requirements, how far we need to go to, to truly advance the language required. So in the past, we've had good guidance and support from uh, council staff and uh, hopefully there's a similar guidance moving forward and some scalability that can be applied. Uh, thank you. Yeah. And I know I'm not supposed to respond to comments, but on this, <laughs> on this one, I, I would say there's no reason to expect any different. Yeah, we would continue to offer early consultation on all covered actions. Okay, again, we will remain until six o'clock as advertised. That gives us roughly another hour or so. So, but there, there is no other formal part of the presentation. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. It is six o'clock. Checking in one last time to see if there are any comments that people would like to offer on the ecosystem regulations proposed by the Delta Stewardship Council. There is no one present in the room other than staff. Would anyone online like to offer a comment before we close today? Seeing no hands, I think we'll go ahead and close the public hearing. Let the record show it's six o'clock. And thank you very much for joining us today. <laughs>